first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me and uh, all the speakers for the great talk talks. And uh, what I want to present today is a joint work with uh, Thomas Erhard and Michele Pagani. And uh, I'm quite excited uh, about uh, this piece of work because it's a case where semantics uh, leads you to introduce a new, a new syntax with good pro properties. Um, actually, it was not really a new syntax because uh, when Thomas um, intro um, introduced he, this syntax, he so soon realized that it has already been in introduced, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. But still, the semantics can prove right uh, an existing syntax, so it's very nice. So what we wanted to do is to, fa to describe a denotational semantics for probabilistic higher order functional computation. And uh, we, for this, we had two ones. The first thing was to uh, represent higher order functional um, computation. And the second thing was to, uh, to be able to encode a simple probabilistic algorithm. For an easy start, we, uh, we, we start with discrete probabilities, probabilities. And what we get it's a, is a fully abstract semantic with respect to, uh, to, to, to uh, syntax. So uh, first, I'd like to, uh, to describe the general framework of our semantics. Among all the, pro the semantics uh, in which we can encode probabilistic com computation, we have the domain semantics, and we have the quantitative semantics that I will use today, and that comes from linear logic. Uh, there have been many people in this group that have been involved in one of the other, and I want to, um, to um, explain what are the similarities and the difference between the two approaches. So in the domain semantics, we interpret types as continuous DCPOs. So X will be a set of finite, uh, final states, which is endowed with um, an order, which encodes uh, the, the amount of information that we have on the final states. So for instance, if we, if we want to, to uh, interpret the type NAT, we will use the um, flat domains of integers, where any integers are incomparable, and, and you have a bottom element that represents divergence. Now, if you want to encode uh, probabilities on that, so you will uh, use the probabilistic monads that will generate all uh, probabilistic distribution over, this, uh, over the domain. So for instance, here you will have a V of n bot, which will be uh, associating to uh, uh, each element, um, sequences that uh, associate a coefficient to each element such that the sum is equal to one. Now, to interpret programs, we use cut continuous functions. Uh, that means that the more information we have on the input, the more information we have on the output. And here, for a program from NAT to NAT, uh, we will have a function from integers to um, probabil probabilistic distribution. But now, if I want to compose two, two programs, I need to be able to feed my semantics with a probabilistic distribution. So I have to extend this function with respect to the probabilistic monad. And to do that, um, um, the syntactical uh, uh, the, the syntax that, uh, that corresponds to this extension is this storage operator. Let n be a sample of x, uh, and I can use it um, as many times as I want in n. The interpretation uh, in the semantics is like this. I have x, which is a random variable. To compute the probability of, of having as outcome q, I will first choose and uh, I will first sample my random variable, get an outcome, n, and feed my program m with n to get the result q. And I just have to, to combine all the possible interactions. Okay, so now for the quantitative semantics. We interpret types as probabilistic spaces which are convex 
um, spaces. So the, we have a basis. This is a set of uh, final states that ca can be compared, compared with this one. And P of X is made of uh, vectors with positive coefficients. These positive coefficients are encountered for two things, the, probabilistic, the probability to have a result and the combinatorics of, um, let's say, how many ways do I have to, go, uh, to get a result. Okay. So to interpret that, I will have as um, basis uh, all the natural numbers and the probabilistic space will be sub-probability distribution over n. The difference here is just in the treatment of the bottom element, because here I just don't explicit the weight I put on the divergence. Now, to interpret programs, I will use analytic functions. So a program, the semantic of a program, will be a function from the probabilistic space of the inputs to the probabilistic space of the outputs, and we can understand it like this. So we are in a quantitative setting. That means that we take care of resources. So to compute Q, I will have to use, let's say, K times my, uh, my input. So M will, co will call its input K times. That means that I will samples, sample my uh, random variable K times and get N1, N2, NK as outcomes with probability, the product of the probability of getting each outcome. Then I feed my program with these inputs that I use to compute Q. And I sum over all the possibilities. So here we are in a call by name setting. That means that each time M calls its input, I compute again the, the outcome of X. So we have similar settings, but we have different strategy of evaluations. Here we have call by value, and here we have call by name. Uh, just a remark, here I say analytic functions, but there are special case of analytic functions. They are, um, they M, the semantic of M can be written as a series, which is the same all over P of N. The problematic in domain, in the domain, sorry, is to find a full subcategory of continuous uh, DCPOs, that is both Cartesian closed and closed under the probabilistic monad v, v. So it's a hard problem and I don't know if uh, there is a solution now. Anyway, um, in the quantitative semantics, thanks to the linear logic uh, machinery, we do have a Cartesian closed category. We, can, we are able to, uh, um, to interpret probabi prob um, probabilities but uh, we, um, and sorry, probabilistic spaces are domains, analytic functions are Scott continuous, but we don't solve this problematic because our category is not full. There are Scott continuous functions that are not analytic. Anyway, we still have a nice result, which is the full abstraction of this semantics with, with respect to a probabilistic ex extension of PCF, which is, um, a pure functional programming language. In this setting, probabilistic um, full abstraction means that two programs have the same, same semantics, if and only if, in any context, they will um, converge with, uh, to the same value with exactly the same probability. Okay, so now we have the, the general framework, we can move to uh, um, more details on the, on the semantics. So we first define the object of my category, which are probabilistic spaces. So as I said, we have the web, which will be the indices of our vectors. And we have a convex space, which is a set of vectors with positive coefficients. And we ask two things on that, the closure, which can be understood like this. So this pairing is the, the quantity of interaction between a program U and an an environment V. The orthogonal of P is then the, the set of environments that will interact with the set of pro with the programs in P in a probabilistic way. And what we ask is that 
the double orthogonal of P is equal to P. So that's the first condition. And the second condition is the, what I call banded, banded covering. It's a, con, um, a technical condition that ensure coefficients to, remain fi uh, to, to be finite. Because uh, when we, we use the linear logic machinery, we, uh, we, it's possible to, um, to generate um, infinite uh, coefficients. Because programs will be interpreted as matrices with infinite um, indices. And when we compose, you compose them, you could have um, infinite coefficients appearing. But with this condition, you, you will have always finite um, coefficients. Uh, as I said before, uh, you have a probabilistic space if and only if you have this technical condition and you have a domain which is convex. Let's look at some examples. So for interpreting one, you will ju have just one index and the, the probabilistic space will be all the, this segment. For bool, you will have two index indexes, and the probabilistic spaces will be pairs, meaning that P is the probability of getting two, and Q is the probability of getting one. For NAT, you will have the sub-probability sub -probability distribution. So at base types, you, will, you really have um, an intuition that follows probabilities. But when you move to higher order, um, even for first, first order uh, uh, functions, you, you lose this intuition. Here, the, the indices of the vectors will be finite multisets of true and false. And the, um, the probabilistic space will be uh, operators that preserve probabi probabilistic spaces, so that will send uh, vectors in this probabilistic space to this probabilistic space. Here you can see that it looks like an analytic function in two different uh, variables. Okay, now for the morphisms, I just, before going to, to the, morph moving to the morphisms, I want to um, give you the general framework of linear logic. So in linear logic, you have a linear category whose objects here are, are probabilistic spaces, and morphisms are linear functions. This category is a symmetric monoidal closed category with <coughs> byproduct, and uh, you can build on this category an exponential, which is a commonad, such that for each uh, object A, bang A is equipped with a symmetric con co uh, commonoidal structure. Thanks to this commonad, you will be able to compute the nonlinear category, the classic category, whose objects are also probabilistic spaces and whose morphisms are analytic functions. So we, we get a Cartesian closed category in which we can um, interpret probabilistic PCF. You see here that this encoding of the exponential is uh, already using the call by name setting because what you are doing is um, a program of this type We use a bunch of inputs to compute its output. Okay, so let's move into details to uh, the linear category. Morphisms will be matrices indexed by the indices of the, the input and the indices of the output. And what we ask is that these matrices um, are operators that preserve probabilistic spaces. This is just the matrix product. For, for instance, if we look at um, uh, the morphisms from NAT to NAT, we will get stochastic matrices just by applying this definition. Now, to go from the linear world to the nonlinear one, we need the exponential. It is defined as, as follows. The, the indices of the, the vectors will be finite multisets. And the probabilistic space will be generated by these vectors, which are um, x is uh, in 
this probabilistic space, and the exponential uh, uh, exponentiation of x is defined as follow. The probability, uh, sorry, the coefficient associated associated to this finite multiset is the multiplication of uh, these coefficients. So that means that the exponential sorry, exponentiation of x can be seen as a bag of copies of x. For instance, if I have a coin p, which gives you a 2 with probability p and 4 with probability 1 minus p, and I have a, a bag of uh, such coins, uh, I will get no coins with probability 1 if I don't take any, uh, any ball. And if I, I take two balls, I will get twice true with probability p, uh, to, uh, p multiplied by p. This, uh, exponent, on this exponential, we can um, construct a common ad whose components are like this. And for each x, we have a symmetric common unit. That means that we have a co-contraction that allows you to duplicate uh, vectors in here and a co-weakening that allows you to erase uh, things in bang x. Okay, so now I can define the nonlinear uh, morphisms. I will just combine the definition of linear morphisms and of the exponential. So I just replace here the indices by finite multisets, and I replace here uh, the vectors by uh, vectors in this probabilistic space. Okay, what is nice here is that we have a density theorem which says that to know if uh, such a matrix is a morphism in my, in my classy category, I only have to test it on the exponentiation of x for x in here. So I don't have to test it for any um, vectors in here, but I only have to test it on the exponentiation of, the, of these vectors. So you can see here that this can be seen as a monomial. So my function here is an analytic function with infinitely many um, uh, parameters. Okay. So if we look at a, <coughs> an example and we compute this nonlinear morphism, we get um, vectors such that this coefficient has to be like this. Don't try to compute it. Uh, <laughs> Okay, and if we try to, um, to compute the semantic of a program, we'll get something which looks like, like, th like this. Why? So this is a program which is recursively defined. It tests twice its input if it gets two different uh, um, values, it um, uh, terminates, or, and if not, it uh, starts again. Um, um, it can uh, f feel st um, you can feel it strange, but here recall that we are in a call by name uh, setting. So that means that each time we see x, x, we uh, recompute it. So we really can get different values. <coughs> so the the thing is here that uh, we we do have a problem of definability because here is the best, the biggest coefficient that we can get by interpreting a program. But here you see that uh, our morphisms um, can have bigger uh, coefficients. So there are a lot of morphisms that cannot be defin defined as the interpretation of a program. Also we have this... Ask, is, is there a meaning to these coefficients in terms of numbers of paths? Or? Computation paths or something? Yes. Like that. This is representing two things the probability of getting this, uh, uh, this multisets and the number of paths to get this multiset. That is why it is bigger than one. So, um, also, we have this problem of definability. We have full abstraction. The, the adequacy direction is 
quite easy. And for the full abstraction, we had to uh, reason by contradiction and suppose that these two uh, matrices are different. So they differ on one index. And the trick is to define testing terms that do not depend on M or N, but that depend on the index on which they differ. Then we use the uh, analyticity, the regularity of our function to, uh, to conclude. So uh, that means that uh, our testing terms depend on parameters, and we need to find parameters. Uh, we need to. Um, to make uh, to vary our parameters so that we have different uh, these are analytic functions so if they differ we know that there is one point on which they differ and we use this proper this property to define our testing terms no i was asking what does regularity mean uh, re regularity means <laughs> Um, when you have two different, um, in the real case, when we, you have two different uh, uh, analytic functions, you can find a point on which they d differ. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> okay, so we were super happy well, on this result, but we forgot um, something. That's the problem with uh, theorists. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there is the Graal full abstraction, and then, then there is the, practic uh, um, the practical thing. So we had this one to, uh, to be able to encode a uh, probabilistic uh, uh, algorithm. Okay. And uh, we, we failed. <laughs> anyway, le let's look at uh, this problem. We have an array with zero and one cells, and we want to find uh, an index uh, of a cell containing zero. So the the idea is just to randomly choose an index, test if, the, if it is a zero cell. If yes, you just uh, output the, uh, the index. But in PCF, uh, we cannot do this storage things, thing. So what we can do is just try doing like this. But what happened is we are in, co in a cobain M setting. So first, I choose randomly uh, an index. I find a zero cell, and then I choose randomly another index, uh, and I, I, I output it. So uh, it was a, a nice story. <laughs> but we, uh, we, uh, we believe we all trust in semantics. So uh, we decided to, to look more cl uh, closely on the, the interpretation of NAT. And we discovered that um, on this interpretation, we can, we can interpret the storage operator. Why? Because we can um, interpret a co-contraction and a co-weakening that allows us to duplicate or to erase natural numbers. Um, so we, we were able to put this storage oper operator in the, in the syntax and then to interpret uh, our probabilistic algorithm. But we were not still satisfied with this. We wanted to know on which types can we um, define a storage operator. So what uh, we, we tr the, the structures that we need is the co-contraction and co-reckoning. And we realized that co-algebras are the solution because uh, the, um, the co because the, when we apply the commonad bank to an object, we have a commonoid structure. Every coalgebra on this commonad will inherit from this commonoid structure. So, uh, if we have a commonoid structure, values can be stored. <coughs> so, the next step was to, um, to try to define a class of types that are interpreted as coalgebra. So, because bang is a commonad, bang x is a coalgebra. And then coalgebras are stable by, by tensor, coproduct, and fixed points. So now we, we were able to interpret types like, uh, such as NAT, streams, actually lazy streams, and list. That's the, that is the type of uh, list of Kamen. So we finally get this probabilistic call by push values that have been uh, introduced 20 years ago by uh, Paul Levy. And the idea is as follows. So we have two different so kinds of types. We have the positive types. 
So we have bank sigma, we have the tensor of two positive types, we have the coproduct, and we have the possibility of making fixed points. And we have general types, which can be positive or linear, a linear application of a positive type on the left and a general type on the right. We also have two kinds of terms. We do have values and uh, general programs. So for the values, we have the uh, unit term. We have the stack of a program or the box of, uh, of a program. We have pairs because in the, uh, the island Bamour category, the tensor is a Cartesian product. So here we have pairs. We have the construction for the coproduct and for the, uh, the fixed point <coughs> operator, um, the fixed point of types. In, for terms, we have the, the possibility of making uh, a thunk, of open, um, opening this thunk, the thunk, or opening the box. We do have a linear application and a linear abstraction. So if we want to encode the usual application, we need to use the linear application and the boxing. We are able to encode natural numbers uh, and to encode the storage operator for uh, positive types. Um, we still have probabilistic full abstraction. Um, we, we had to, to work a lot to, to have this. Now, the, uh, the easy direction is the full abstraction because it was roughly uh, the generalization of the full abstraction for PCF, for probabilistic PCF. But for uh, adequacy, we had to, to work a lot because we had to handle values separately because we are uh, using fixed point of types. Uh, so we had to use a lot, a lot of, t actually not to use, but to combine a lot of, um, of tools such as step indexing, the orthogonality, um, pit tricker of um, um, fixed points of, pair of lo pairs of logical relations. And uh, uh, we, have to, we had to combine all of this in a mixture. And the, the crucial ingredient is the density. So you remember uh, functions of type long x to y. Uh, to know them, we only have to test them on this kind of points because of density. These points are coalgebraic co points. And it is the same thing for other positive types. To know a function from a positive types to a general type, I only have to test it on coalgebraic points. And it is really the key ingredient of the proofs. Can you give an idea of why that's true? Because it seems surprising. You're saying you're right, kind of, you only need to look on the diagonal, as it were. I mean, things that are yeah. just copied from a single value. Mm. So, I have no intuition. It's just working for me uh, at the <laughs> moment. But uh, I hope uh, I get finally an intuition. <laughs> Okay, so I think I can conclude. So we were looking for a functional language that is suitable for writing probabilistic programs. And we, uh, we finally found out probabilistic call by push value, which is an extension of uh, Paul Levy's uh, call by push value. It combines call by name and call by value. Um, values are posit of positive types so that they can be duplicated or is erased according to their um, commona commonoidal structure. And uh, we, we can, uh, programs can handle base types such as NATs, streams, um, and other types, and we have full abstraction. <laughs> and I just want to make a, comment, a quick comment here. This full abstraction result doesn't need to, uh, to make a quotient, such um, as the full abstraction uh, for, um, for game semantics. It's really, we, we do not touch on the, um, on the morphisms to get the, uh, the full abstraction result. So the next steps are uh, to move <coughs> from discrete probabilities to a continuous one. 
uh, and also to try to combine non-determinism non with probabilities. So I think we can define a um, non-deterministic monad on the linear category, and what we have to do is to extend it on the non-linear one. And uh, another direction would be to interpret functional relative programming, because now we can uh, interpret streams in this uh, category and see if we, uh, we can have more uh, information of uh, such uh, reactive programs. And uh, thank you for thank your you. attention. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I guess this is going to be a comment. Um, so someone might ask, so why do you get full abstraction in this setting without a quotient and it's so hard to do another setting? This is something um, it's actually very interesting because if you do, for example, a CPO semantic and you try to make it fully abstract, you run into things like the parallel or, you know, which exists in the semantic. So the interesting thing to me is that if you do a parallel or in this probabilistic setting, then you end up getting negative coefficients. For example, the probability that one of two coins gives you heads is something like 2p minus p squared. And it's exactly the absence of the negative coefficients somehow, which prevents the parallelism and gives you a, a fully abstract model, which I think is very interesting. So uh, uh, congratulations on <laughs> having made that work. And there is question. Yeah. Um, definition of the exponential modality sort of builds in the assumption that when you pick several times from the same type, you pick independently. Is there any hope for extending things to have an exponential that allows some kind of dependence between the successive mm -hmm. choices? So we, d we didn't try, uh, try to define an exponential with uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, independent, uh, non-independent um, things. But uh, what we know is that the, this exponential is the free one. So that means that you, you will, um, wh whatever you will construct, you will have to, to be able to um, um, uh, to construct a, um, uh, a functor from this exponential to the, to the other one. Yeah, coming back to the, um, the sort of uh, issue of getting fully abstract models. So, um, in the pure PCF case, we know that, it, that, that actually, that in some sense, there can't be uh, a quotient free fully abstract construction because of Lotus theorem. There's a decidability thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it depends what, what features you add to the pure functional setting, whether you need a quotient or not. So for example, the game semantics, which um, uh, um, I guess Ansar Rashama did um, for probabilistic PCF with state, uh, doesn't need a quotient, as indeed is true for other really abstract models when you have state. And in some sense here, you're sort of I'm, I'm sort of wondering if you're close to having state by having a, a form of state, um, not, not a full uh, sort of uh, thing, but by the fact that you, you know, the way you're representing the, the coin, as it were, in this sort of uh, consistent fashion. Mm -hmm. so, so there may be something also in the thinking about why this happens that uh, is, is, of, is of that element. And, well, actually, the other thing I wanted to ask is usually with coherent spaces, you have stability as a Notion. I mean, where does that, does that, what, what happens to that in this picture? Um, so the, uh, so the stability, um, uh, the analytic functions here ca can be um, um, like a, a generalization of st stable functions. I, I think. Right, because I mean, usually there's, but, but you built in <coughs> enough that you're sitting inside the mm. There's no conflict with it, because usually with stable functions, they're incomparable with the Scott continuous functions once you go to higher order things, but yeah. that isn't happening here, I guess. Uh, I don't know. So I was uh, both excited and anxious to see that you want to do with, deal with continuous probabilities. Mm -hmm. So usually that involves working with Polish spaces or some kind of metric space. I'm wondering how all this apparatus of coherent spaces is going to be built on top of that. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? No, I, I don't have a, I prefer first to, uh, to check what I, I want to do before <laughs> speaking of it. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.